So today we're going to be talking about board committees and we're going to have a look at how the board has delegated down its authority and responsibilities to committees of the board which are mostly made up by members of the board. There may be a few external invitees. In any event, these are all people who fall under Section 75, 76 and 77 of the Companies Act in terms of disclosures of interest, fiduciary duties and personal liability. And they are going to assist the board in ensuring that the strategy and all the policies and procedures that support the strategy are implemented. And just as importantly, that the right type of disclosure happens that comes back up to the board and ultimately onto stakeholders. So let's have a look at a typical board structure and how it might delegate down responsibility to certain committees. And today we're looking at NetCare, uh, which as you probably know is the big hospital group. So they have governance committees that come straight out of their board. And those committees are made up of the audit, risk, nomination, remuneration, social and ethics, and quality leadership. Now of those six committees, Audit, risk, nomination, remuneration, social and ethics, those are, are pretty normal ones and those are the ones we're going to discuss today. But a board can also develop a committee which um, might talk to its specific needs. So um, with healthcare, NetCare obviously believes that quality leadership is such an important issue to it that they have formed a board committee specifically to look at that. You might find in a mining company where capital investment is so important that capital investment is a specific committee. You may also find in, in a construction company where safety is an issue that there is specifically a safety committee that deals with those issues. And then the board has also got its executive committee this might be made up of members of the board, the executive members, such as the CEO, the CFO, the COO, and maybe some of the um, managing directors of subsidiary companies. And then it has its operational committees, which it's divided up according to what it um, requires in terms of effectively running its organization. And then they show you how some of those committees uh, from an operating perspective, might report directly into a board committee such as the Social and Ethics Committee. A lot of this sort of structure is left by legislation to companies to determine how they want to set up their structure in the best interests of a company, what works for the company and what the company requires. However, the Audit Committee and the Social and Ethics Committee, those are included in the Companies Act and there are certain instances where companies must have those committees and where they must have those committees, they need to, to do certain things. King speaks a lot about committees and these sort of delegating structures, specifically ensuring that there's a lot of clarity around roles and everybody understands exactly what they're responsible for and what they're responsible for reporting back up again through this chain. There's a lot of focus on risk, um, remuneration, and, uh, and nominations in, in King, particularly because these are the areas that aren't governed by the Act and have very little other regulation around them, but are equally important to ensuring that that entire board structure operates efficiently. So let's just recap a little bit when, on delegation by the board. So it's obviously not possible for the board to actually do everything it is that they need to do in their personal capacity, so they need to delegate down. So management then um, receives these these day-to-day -day task instructions from the board uh, around implementing the strategy, um, particular policies that have been implemented in order to deliver that strategy. And then meeting uh, management then appoints its subordinates, such as the employees, and it goes down the chain 
who actually go and do all the work that's required and as they delegate down, so they expect reports back up again in terms of responsibility and authority. This all comes from the agency theory where one person delegates responsibility to another person to perform a task. The person who delegates the responsibility remains accountable for that um, task being delivered and the person who receives that, that delegation is responsible to actually go out and perform the task. The delegating manager, of course, remaining accountable for the satisfactory completion of that task, and the delegated employee is ultimately responsible for doing the work. King is quite vocal on ensuring that this structure is well documented and well understood and actually has a lot of thought put into it. There's no point in having a brilliant board that's well constituted to think of a good strategy if you can't very well implement it. So what King says is the board must ensure that the appointment of management and delegation to management contribute to that clarity of roles in the company and that effective exercise of authority and discharging of these responsibilities. Notwithstanding the ability to delegate, there are matters that the board must ensure remain with itself, and we refer to those as reserved matters. So the board must approve a delegation of authority, and into that there will be specific authority to appoint certain executive members and management who will then hold certain authorities which they can pass down. The board must disclose to its stakeholders that it is satisfied with its delegation of authority and that it believes it's effective. And the board must continue to oversee the key management functions and ensure that there are competent and authorized individuals who have appropriate resources in order to implement these strategic imperatives. And then to ensure that there's always succession planning in place so that if one person to whom responsibility has been delegated then falls out of this chain, that there's somebody there to keep the chain connected. Committees from the board that have been delegated down with responsibility will need to have terms of reference or a charter which set out exactly what it is that this committee needs to do. When you think back to what King said around clarity of roles, authority, responsibility, these committees need to understand what it is that they are responsible for and what is expected from them. So in this, these charters, in terms of reference, we need to know the composition of the committee, who has to sit on it, and, and as we go through this, lecture, you'll see that the Companies Act actually dictates in some instances the membership of committees. Um, there might be certain appointment criteria for members. And then we may be able to have members who are not actually members of the board. So this does happen where a committee requires a particular bit of uh, technical advice, uh, technical input from somebody who's a specialist in a certain area, but they don't need that person to be on the board or an employee of the company on an ongoing basis. So they just bring them in for these committee purposes and um, there needs to be a process in place to how we go about appointing those people because they are ex 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 essentially outsiders who are coming into our board. Okay, then obviously this, these charters need to say the committee's overall role and associated responsibilities and functions and how they may delegate responsibility down. Again, these people are not going to be able to do the work themselves on a day-to-day -day basis. They're going to focus on certain activities and then they're going to delegate and through policies and procedures how these things get done. These committees can be permanent committees or what we refer to as a standing committee. So your audit committee or your risk committee would typically be a standing or permanent committee. Or you could have an ad hoc committee that you might have for one off instance. So for example, um, Anglo-American, uh, considering moving outside of the Joburg CBD into um, one of the suburban um, business centers, they've set up a committee of the board to have a look at the feasibility of doing that. It's a once-off ad hoc project, and when the committee makes its recommendation to either move or not move, then they may um, 
disband this committee because it has served its purpose. As authority goes down, so re reporting disclosure requirements go up, so these terms of reference must be very clear on how committees report back to the board. The committee is also going to need resources, financial and otherwise, and it's going to need information and how it accesses that information and what resources are made available to it can be set out in these terms of reference. How the committee goes about meeting and convening a meeting needs to be done in a formal manner. If the meeting is not properly convened or there's not a quorum, it can't really pass a valid decision which it can then make a recommendation to the board. So we need to make sure that these committees actually follow a formal process. And then on an ongoing basis, we need to have a look at how the committee is performing and ensure that it's staying up to date and it's continuously improving just recalling back some of those King recommendations about continuous improvement and um, board performance and evaluations. So let's have a look at our five main committees that we typically deal with in governance structures and what legislation and regulation applies to them. Audit committees are mandatory for public companies, state-owned companies, and any private company where the MOI says that this company must have an audit committee. Obviously, only public companies can be listed on the JSE, so therefore they would have to have an audit committee. And King says, we recommend that companies have an audit committee. However, if they are not able to have a full audit committee as envisaged by the Companies Act, then they should have, some, have a committee which constitutes some element of independence. So there should be some non-executive directors that's sitting on this committee having a look at those financial statements and bringing an, an, an element of independence, particularly where companies are issuing audited financial statements. So if you are issuing audited financial statements, which would mean that you were a, a company with a public interest score of over 350, you do not need to have an audit committee at that point. It is only if you become a public company, your MOI requires it. But since you are issuing audited financial statements, you're probably hitting quite a lot of a stakeholder group. There are a lot of people who are impacted by what you do, and it would be in the best interest of the company if there was somebody independent having a look at those financials. So that's the scalability and proportionality elements that King 4 brings in to our recommended governance environment. Then the Social and Ethics Committee. This is also one of the committees that is mandated by the Companies Act. Listed public companies, state-owned companies, and any company with a public interest score of over 500 must have a social and ethics committee. The importance of this is that as a company gets bigger and bigger, it starts impacting this bigger stakeholder group. And then legislation wants us to be aware of that and to think about how we impact that broader stakeholder community as we do business. Hence that public interest score of 500. If you have a public interest score that big, you are hitting a lot of people. You are impacting a lot of people. We need to make sure that you are thinking broader than simply your profits. Obviously, this is mandatory for a listed company. And what King is saying with regards to every other company that is not required to have it in terms of any legislation or regulation, think about the impact you are having on your stakeholders, including your environment. Think about these things and have a dedicated committee function, even if it's part of another committee. At least have some dedicated function that is sitting and thinking about these responsibilities. Remuneration committee is not required by the Companies Act, but is definitely required by the JSE listings requirements. And King is saying, as it does go on for risk and nomination as well, to say, if you are not required to have a committee of this nature, then definitely have a group of people, preferably with an element of independence, thinking about these areas of responsibility. 
Risk Committee also not legislated and not required by the JSE listings requirements. Nomination Committee equally not in the Companies Act and not required by the, by the JSE. Typically, if a company is large enough to be listed on the JSE, you will find that it has a risk committee and you'll find that it probably has a nomination committee too. You can combine some of these committee functions depending on your company structure and what you require. We do frequently see that the audit committee is combined with the risk committee and we will talk about that. There's, that is permitted as long as the regulatory and legislated requirements for audit committees are still met within that audit and risk committee structure, then you're fine to do that. Okay, so let's look at um, audit at um, an audit committee in particular. So this is mandated by the Companies Act. The key functions for an audit committee is to nominate an independent auditor for the company and to determine that terms of engagement between the company and the auditor. Now, I'm going to hover a little bit on this point. The members of an audit committee will be appointed by the shareholders at an annual general meeting. And it's very important to bear that in mind that audit committee members, as much as they're members of the board, and this is a board subcommittee, there is a direct line of, of responsibility between the audit committee and the shareholder base. And this primary responsibility around ensuring that the company has an independent auditor is critically important to those shareholders. They have to make sure that the auditor that they appoint um, complies with the Companies Act and with other regulative legis and legislation that applies to auditors, such as the OBA requirements. Then auditors are sometimes used by companies for services outside of the normal audit regime. So you have your normal financial year end audit. From time to time, you might want to use your auditors to perform other functions for you. They know the company well, so they can perform these functions quite quickly and efficiently and probably quite accurate. And that's what we refer to as non-audit services. The danger with non-audit services is that an audit company can start making more money from its non-audit consulting type of business than it would make from its audit. And then what might happen is that the independence of the auditor would be tarnished. And this is exactly what happened in the Enron matter, uh, the collapse of the great power company in 2001 in America, and essentially Arthur Anderson were earning so much money from non-audit services that they turned a blind eye to all the terrible financial reporting issues that were happening that they should have been considering as an independent auditor. So there's a big responsibility on audit committees to make sure that any of these non-audit services are properly managed, how far they um, extend, and to ensure that that auditor always remains independent. So any contracts that relate to non-audit services would need to be pre-approved by the audit committee. The audit committee is also the place that any unhappy person goes to when it comes to the annual financial statements, how they've been presented, what accounting policies have been applied, how the internal controls of the company are managed, or any matter related thereto. The audit committee will preside, uh, will provide oversight in respect of how that company's assurance functions and services operate. And we're going to go into assurance functions in a bit of detail in this presentation. And they can also give oversight over the integrity of the financials. And we will talk about why that is so important, as well as um, all the other duties that have been delegated to it. They remain accountable to shareholders in terms of the appointment of the auditor and they remain accountable to the board for anything else that's been delegated to them. They may also have this responsibility for governance if they have sufficient capacity to do so. 
they must meet at least once a year with the internal and external auditors without management present in order to exchange views and concerns. And this is important because it gives that independent auditor of an opportunity to, to voice to the independence of the audit committee without any interference from management. And then the board may give it other duties such as overseeing SENS announcements or uh, public relations duties that, that it, it may be required to have a look at. Let's have a look at how an audit committee is constituted. This is in the Companies Act, and it is very, very important to remember this. This is the one committee that must contain only independent non-executive directors. Your CFO and your CEO cannot be members of this committee at all. They will attend audit committee meetings and they will present and they will give financial information and they will answer questions. But it is only the independent non-executive directors who are allowed to sit on this committee. And the Companies Act defines those independent non-executive directors as being directors who are not involved in the day-to-day -day business, have not been executives of the company within a recent period, and are not major suppliers or contractors. King goes on with um, 10 requirements around assessing independence, and it's always a good idea to apply those broader application around assessing independence and make sure that all of those members are indeed independent. King also recommends that this committee excludes the chair of the board, the chair of the board needing to remain completely independent and neutral over, um, over the board and having that complete oversight. The audit committee is also quite a time-consuming committee and including the chairman in that process might, might also not be in the best interest of the board management as a whole. In terms of the knowledge and skills that are required for audit committee members, as a collective they must have the necessary financial skills, literacy and experience in order to execute their duties efficiently. So this does give us scope to have a look at what the company requires. Every audit com member, committee member needs to be financially literate, but they don't all need to be CAs. If it's an investment entity that we're talking about, you may have some investment managers. If it's a mining company that we may look at, you may need to have some of those technical skills on that audit committee so that they can properly give the value around assessing financials, assessing quantums of capital expenditure, for example, and how the company utilizes its financial resources. Disclosures. Obviously, if you have responsibilities, you have a responsibility to disclose back up again. There are quite a few responsibilities on committees which um, around their disclosures, which are pretty standard. And as we go through the presentation, you will see these all coming through for all of the committees. We would need to know and disclose to our stakeholders what the role and the functions are of the audit of the audit committee, how it's composed, particularly importantly given its requirements around independence. Who are the members of this committee and what are their qualifications and experience that can ensure that they meet that minimum requirement around necessary skills? Do they attend the meetings regularly? And do any external advisors attend the meetings? What were their key areas of focus during the reporting period? How many times did they meet? Is the committee itself satisfied that it has fulfilled its responsibilities in, the, in terms of its terms of reference? What significant matters did the committee consider in terms of the annual financial statements and how did it address these matters? What is its view on the quality of the external audit or the independent audit? What are its views on the effectiveness of the chief audit executive who would be the head of internal audit or by a different name, somebody who, who was in charge of internal controls? And the related arrangements for internal controls, are the committee happy with those? Are the, is the committee 
happy with the effectiveness of the design and the implementation of the internal financial controls. Has the committee discovered any significant weaknesses which might result in a material loss or fraud or corruption or an error? These are typically the disclosures we would want the audit committee to make. There are, however, mandatory disclosures that the audit committee must make. And we will go into those in a bit of detail. In high level, the Act says that the committee must describe how it carried out its functions, whether it is satisfied with the independence of that auditor, and then make comments in any way that it believes it are appropriate on the financial statements, the company's accounting practices, and on the internal financial controls of the company. Let's have a look at financial reporting and corporate governance and why financial reporting is so important and why it is so important that we have an audit committee constituted of independent members to ensure that this information that we put into the public domain is correct. If you think about integrated reports and financial statements, that is the, the bulk and the most important, most critical sources of information to any shareholder and the stakeholders broadly around how the company is performing. It forms the primary disclosure responsibility from the board to its shareholders. It must therefore be clear and understandable and it must be able to be assessed as to be reasonable and accurate. The person who reads it must be able to understand it. It must also be reliable and believable. Reliability and honesty, though, can be tainted. There can be fraud, which is intentional. And there can be errors which are unintentional in preparing the financial statements. If you go on to SENS, you read through SENS, every few days you'll see that somebody has put out an announcement to say that they're amending or restating something in their financial statements because an error was discovered. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a fraud. Humans do make mistakes. But the more internal financial controls we have and the more effective those are, so the less likelihood of fraud and errors should occur in our financial statements, making sure that they are reliable and believable. The other area where the reliability and honesty of financial statements can be undermined is around window dressing, the financial performance or the financial position of the company. And what this is, is using accounting policies that the company can develop for itself within the ambit of international financial reporting standards. And they can account for things in a certain way, recognize certain revenue, um, not recognize certain liabilities in such a way that the company's financial performance looks better to the reader than it actually is. Given the complexities around financial reporting, it is actually very easy to do this. It's actually quite difficult to identify and it's quite difficult to um, persuade board members that something they've taken a view on could be viewed as window dressing. And this is where a lot of areas of debate happen in boardrooms with independent auditors and, um, and, uh, and I think in some respects where there's some responsibility that directors need to take. I think we as consumers of this information are more open to receiving bad news and we would prefer to receive bad news that we believed was transparent and accurate than receive good news that we were not entirely sure we could trust. So in order to ensure that this financial information that goes out into the public domain is reliable and, and has that degree of honesty, King has developed the combined assurance model. It first came into play in King 3 and was subsequently developed again in King 4. And essentially what they are saying here is that companies must ensure that all the assurance services and functions enable a, a, an effective control environment in the company. Assurance functions and services are those areas of the business that check other areas of the business. 
very simply put. So internal control, external control, risk management, reporting lines that go up, you'd get your report from your subordinate and you check that it's correct. You are performing an assurance function when you do that. Then you report up to your boss and your boss checks that it's correct and so on and so forth. Even that day-to-day -day information, sales numbers, creditors books, debtors books, stock in hand, all of those little checks, those are all very important assurance services and they go from a very small example such as, as stock in hand all the way up to um, what your independent or external auditors might view and check. And the idea being that when all of these work together um, and are supported, the integrity of that information that goes out is going to be very good. It is very important externally, as we've spoken, that that information is correct. But bear in mind that the same information that goes externally to our shareholders, and they get to decide whether or not they want to buy more shares, that same information is used internally by our internal decision makers, such as our board of directors, our managers. They do use this information to decide our remuneration structures. Can we have a bonus? Can we not have a bonus? Is this a good stock product to keep in hand? Do we need to change our strategy in any way? So the quality of that information can actually have a, have a severe impact on the strategy if it's not accurately correct. So King is saying, bring all of those assurance models together and combine them and make sure there is a nice overlap so that all of those methods produce a qu one quality result at the end of the day. All functions have responsibility for assuring that the financial reports are, are of a high standard and they all need to work together. And this is a nice illustrative example of what it looks like when they all work together. So you've got management, internal, external assurance providers, all providing that assurance in a combined manner to address the risk areas that the company might be facing. In addition to our combined assurance model, those three together, King has also defined the five lines of assurance. So not to get confused between these three bubbles, this is still within the context of our three bubbles, we now have five lines. And if you think about them being part of those three bubbles, and these are five steps through which the business would go, a piece of business would go, in order to ensure that there were no errors or frauds and to eliminate that risk and to enhance our internal financial controls. The first line would start with your line functions. So these are your day-to-day -day people that are on the first line of defense that you would have. Um, to reducing risk and ensuring that there's accuracy. This is typically clerks, cashiers, um, stock managers taking delivery of stock arriving from trucks, making sure that all the stock is there that was ordered from the, from the supplier. Then we would have specialist functions that facilitate and oversee specific areas such as risk and opportunity. So these are your risk managers, um, possibly parts of your internal financial control structures. They have a specialist role around looking at risk and assurance. Then we have our internal assurance processes and providers such as our internal audit functions. And we have our external assurance providers who would be our independent or our external assure, uh, auditors. And then last of all, the very last line of defense is that board and, the, and its committees. They are the people who are going to approve the annual financial statements. They're going to sign them off and say, once it's gone from one to four, by the time it gets to me, I'm going to give it a final check and I'm going to be happy that all of those four lines underneath me have sussed out what's going on. They've eliminated all errors and they've reduced all opportunities for fraud as much as we can. And I can put my hand on my heart and release these financials 
and say that they are trustworthy and reliable. It's the audit committee's responsibility to ensure that this combined assurance model is implemented and it actually effectively results in this combining and aligning of these assurance activities. There are lots of benefits of using this combined approach. The company is given this opportunity to maximize its risk and governance oversight. So we will have a look at, at risk, but any risks around internal errors and, and frauds and whatever you have it, that is reduced through these processes. The opportunity to reduce them is maximized, if you want to put it differently. And that all the efficiencies that have that opportunity to, to reduce errors, frauds, and misstatements have been minimized. So risk opportunity uh, is maximized and um, control inefficiencies and errors, frauds, and misstatements are all minimized. External audit, or if you will, independent audit. You can use these interchangeably, and I do use them interchangeably in this presentation. When you are reporting, though, or in your own company structures, pick one and be consistent with it. Okay, so the purpose of an independent audit is to make sure, as far as possible, that financial statements are objective and reliable. Audits are, are based on sampling, so there's no guarantee that they will actually find a fraud or a theft or an inaccuracy or that any of those things did not occur because they don't go through every single piece of paper, although it does feel like they go through every single piece of paper. But it is based on a sample and they do make these disclaimers that they actually haven't checked every single piece of paper so they may have missed something. They must give a report to the stakeholders that says that after completing the audit, they um, are reasonably happy with the financial reports. And we'll talk about what that statement says. The main purposes for this statement are firstly to give an expert and independent opinion that the financial statements are a true and fair reflection of the financial position of the company at the financial year end and its performance during the year. And secondly, to confirm that the financial statements comply with the relevant laws and accounting statements. So that's what our auditors really focus on. True and fair reflection of financial performance and were they produced in compliance with the laws and accounting standards? One would hope that if these financial statements had been produced in compliance with all laws and accounting standards, that they would be a true and fair reflection and that an outsider reading them could make a, an informed decision. Let's have a look at internal audit. At this point, I do just want to say that not all companies have internal audit. Some companies are too small to have internal audit, and even listed companies, small listed companies, do not have the resources or even a need for internal audit. But what must happen is that those same assurance processes that an internal audit might function or perform, those must still be met. The end goals must still be met through different methods. And you can do that on a scalable approach. Essentially, though, if you do have an internal audit and the objectives of an internal audit, if you don't have one, must be able to deliver these same objectives. There should be an ability to monitor and review the effectiveness of internal audit functions and risk management systems. If you have um, a head of internal audit, that internal audit function would uh, be overseen by this person and the audit committee would appoint or remove this, this person. The audit committee must also ensure that this internal audit function has adequate resources to perform its task and that it has some degree of independence 
internal audit and the head of internal audit is somewhat like a company secretary in the sense that they have to have some arm's length from management because they have to be reviewing or advising on management's activities. So they are this counterweight to management, which is why their appointment is done by the audit committee. The audit committee must review the annual audit internal audit plan and ensure that it is risk-based. So when we talk about something being risk-based, it actually focuses on the areas where there is risk of error or fraud taking place. It doesn't help if we have a plan, we're going to go and do our internal audit, but it has no relevance to where those risk areas are. So for example, if you have cash coming in through your business, such as a Woolworths, all that cash at the till, if your internal risk plans don't address the fact that there are risks around cash, then it is not going to be a very good internal audit plan. The audit committee must also review all of the reports that come in from the internal auditors. And they must review the response from management to any findings and recommendations by internal auditors. They must meet with the head of internal audit annually without management present to discuss issues in the same way that one would they would meet with the external auditors so there is that that opportunity to make disclosures without fear of of management interference and then the audit committee must make sure that management addresses all of the issues that are raised by both internal and external auditors generally speaking the audit committee must make sure that the um, efforts of internal and external auditors are all coordinated in that combined assurance model and that it as a committee itself is operating to maximum efficiencies and they must recommend any changes that they themselves need in their own functional abilities to discharge all these duties. This is all quite a lot that falls on an audit committee's shoulders as I'm sure you can imagine so they need to make sure that they are continuously geared to deliver. Let's have a look at what the Companies Act says that the audit committee must uh, disclose. There's a concept of key audit matters. These are for companies that need to be audited. Listed companies have placed a great deal of focus on key audit matters. And these are exactly as they are described, significant matters that would impact the financial reporting of the company particularly where judgments have had to be made. If, for example, there is a very big contract that the company is doing, they're building a building and it's going to take the next five years, one of the judgments that management will need to make is, will our customer, our client, pay us at the end of this project? That would be a judgment. There is an agreement to say that they must be paid. That's fine. but when we do a risk assessment, do we think these people are actually going to pay us? That would be a judgment that's made. And um, that would be a key audit matter that the auditors would come along and they would consider the judgment that manage, management's made, weigh up all the facts. It's a good customer. They normally do pay. They have a big reputation. There are guarantees in place. It's very likely they will pay. So we agree with with management in this judgment that that this risk will be mitigated and that payment on this contract will be made. They also need to disclose significant accounting policies that are used to prepare the financial statements. As we discussed, financial uh, statements can be window dressed and how companies apply accounting policies is usually the way in which they dress these windows, so to speak. So we want our internal uh, our, sorry, our independent external auditors to be having a look at, at, at that. And through the deliberations, the audit committee needs to report on, um, on those, those considerations, what those accounting policies are, um, any changes that, that have been made, any significant estimates, any of these key judgments that have been made. Management needs to tell the audit committee about the, how the methods that they've used to account for any significant or unusual transactions, 
um, how the accounting treatment has been applied, um, if different accounting treatments have been applied. Management need to tell the audit committee that so the audit committee has an opportunity to assess them with the independent auditors. And then the audit committee needs to take into account those, those independent auditors' views on whether or not those accounting policies and judgments are in fact correct. So there's three wheels if you if you think about it in terms of assessing those those financial statements. You have management who does all the work and puts the financial statements together and applies all the policies and they tell the audit committee what they've done and the auditors come along and they assess what management has done and then they tell the audit committee what they think management has done and the audit committee must weigh up all of this advice and make sure that at the end of the day there, those financial statements are indeed a true reflection of the company's financial position. Okay, the audit committee also needs to make sure that those financial disclosures are complete, thorough, and that they give clarity. I think it's quite difficult to, when you apply IFRS correctly, the IFRS financial reporting standards, they're so complex that trying to provide clarity can be quite difficult to the extent that a lot of companies who are particularly impacted by IFRS will produce an IFRS compliant set of financial statements for regulatory purposes, but then they will um, also produce a financial a set of financial statements which has the same information in it, but they'll just present it in a way that management understand, or uh, apologies, not management, that the reader understands better. And where you will see this uh, is in the mining mining sector. Um, they're well known for, for their double set of financials. All it means is that one set is just presented in a way that is, is a bit easier for, for the reader to understand. And there's no mandatory requirements around that as long as they are not misleading. Okay, if the audit committee is unhappy at any point with any aspect of these financial statements, it must tell the board and it must tell the board before the financial statements are put into the public domain and may actually go ahead and mislead anybody because uh, that would be a breach of fiduciary duties. There might be related information that the audit committee also needs to consider around the, the, fin the operating and financial aspects and the corporate governance statements that are made relating to audit and risk management. And the audit committee would also have a look at those statements. King 4 makes recommendations around these financial disclosures. Um, of the audit committee and um, they're not too different from what's in the Companies Act. The audit committee must uh, state that it is happy that the auditor is independent, specifically making reference to the company's controls and policies around non-audit services, the tenure of that that independent order, auditor, how long have they been around for some Independent auditors have been around for so long, one imagines that they may not be independent. And uh, in order to protect that independence, the external auditor's designated partner, the head of that independent auditor, how they rotated, how often they rotate to maintain that independence, and any changes in the management relationship that uh, in management that might affect the relationship or familiarity between the auditors and management. It takes a long time for auditors to understand a company and to work with management. So if there is a change of CEO or CFO, that might be something that is um, going to impact the audit and then the audit committee should, should review that and report on it. The audit committee needs to report on any significant matters that it's identified and how they were addressed. It needs to give um, its view on the quality of the audit and um, the, the audit quality indicators, which is um, gives us guidance as to, to whether or not those, those independent auditors performed the functions that they were brought on board to do. Whether the internal audit and head of internal audit um, performed their functions effectively, 
whether the internal financial controls were sufficient and if not, any weaknesses that might exist that could result in, in a financial loss. How effective the CFO is, whether they are suitably appointed to that position and their finance function. Do they have enough bean counters sitting behind them to support them to ensure that their financial documents are in fact reliable? What assurance has been put in place? So this is that combined assurance model and those five lines of assurance. And is the committee happy that these are effective processes? And ultimately, is the committee happy that it has discharged its duties in terms of its terms of reference? Let's move on to risk committees. Risk committees are not in the Companies Act and they are not required by the JSE listings requirements and sometimes they can be tacked on or become part of an audit committee function. Remember the primary responsibility when it comes to risk as far as a board is concerned is that risk is the enemy of strategy. If you are trying to roll out your strategy you need to understand what those risks are that will be presented in, in, in the success of your strategy. And so you need to manage those risks. So we're going to have a look at the risk committee and what it does. And we're going to have a little bit of a look at risk management procedures and processes that a committee might follow. So the key duties and functions of a risk committee are to identify all opportunities and risks. And we'll hover a little bit on opportunities in a moment that relate to the delivery of the strategy and they need to manage these and make sure that they are being managed. They need to consider the positive and negative effects of the risk of risks that are taken to achieve the strategy. So upside and downside risk. A risk is something that happens unexpectedly and that will cause you a loss. A positive risk or an opportunity risk or an upside risk is something that presents an opportunity as a result of a risk and you can make more of a success of your strategy as a result of that upside or positive that could come out of something. And it is important to ensure that the board considers all elements of risk and that when making any decisions or taking any actions, risk is considered. All of these risks need to be managed pro properly through a risk management policy, which is an, over, an overlaying document and um, sets out how the company is going to, to, to run its risk management strategies. And the, board, the risk committee must make sure that the board understands its risk appetite and its levels for risk tolerance. So we do go into this a little bit, but your risk appetite is the environment in which the company operates. And it, if it does, does not have the appetite for that risk, it cannot operate in that environment. But it wishes to tolerate a much lower level of risk in order to implement its strategy. So its risk tolerance level will be much lower than its risk appetite. Let's have a look at how a risk committee is constituted. So this is in terms of King. And King suggests that this committee has non-executives and executive directors. The idea being that executive directors would have a closer connection to the day-to-day -day operational risks that the company might be experiencing. However, at the end of the day, we are looking for that majority of non-executives, the majority who, of whom are going to be independent, so that you have that independent oversight and balance. The chair may be a chairman of this committee, and we may have members in common with the audit committee, as we've discussed. They also have stock standard disclosures that they need to make to our stakeholders around their responsibilities, functions, how are they composed, um, did they depend on external advisors, what were their key focus areas, 
How many meetings did they have? Are they satisfied that they have fulfilled their terms of reference? What arrangements have they made for managing risk and governing risk? What are the focus areas and objectives for that particular reporting period? What are the key risks to the company? Are there any undue or unexpected or unusual risks that were reported during the that the company experienced during the reporting period? And were there any risks that exceeded the company's tolerance level? So did the company take on more risk than it, it was happy to, to do? Let's have a look at a risk, typical risk process. This little uh, seminar on, on including risk management in our discussion around risk committees is not intended to be a comprehensive risk management lecture, so I ask you to consider it in the ambit of the risk committee's responsibilities and, and not to rely on it as a, as a qualification in risk management. But here we go, this is typically how a risk process operates. You start off at number one with identifying your risks, understanding what risks it is that um, will face that, that will be the enemy of the strategy. You have to evaluate those risks once you've identified them and assess if this risk happened, what would the damage be to the company? And what is the likelihood that this risk might actually take place? Once you have a good understanding of that, you then need to put something in place to control that risk. And this would typically be um, a measurement or an activity. It could be a policy, it could be a plan, and we would often refer to them as the four T's. We either treat the risk through some action, we decide we're going to tolerate this risk, we're not going to do anything with it because it's so low, we might decide this risk is so high, we can't possibly live with it. It exceeds our risk appetite, so we're going to terminate this risk. Or we can transfer this risk, and that's typically insurance. So we drive around in our car on a day-to-day -day basis. The best way of dealing with the risk of somebody crashing into us or stealing our car is insurance. When we look at those risk controls, we also have to consider risk financing. Every aspect of risk management and reducing a risk in any way through a control is going to cost money. Whether you are hiring a very expensive risk manager or you are subscribing for risk insurance or you're just buying a fire extinguisher, there's going to be a cost involved. So you have to make sure that that cost is reasonable given the evaluation of the risk. So how often will that risk happen? And if it does happen, what is the damage going to be? So going back to step two for a second there, if it's a very unlikely risk, very unlikely to happen, and if it did, it would have very, very low impact, we are not going to spend a lot of money trying to address that risk. Once we understand our risk world in which we operate, we need to continuously monitor our risks. Every time we change our strategy or an external environment um, brings us a new risk, such as COVID-19, we need to continuously reassess our risks to ensure that this risk process that we have in place is going to reduce the risks to our strategy and our strategy can still be implemented successfully. The board has certain responsibilities in terms of risk management. The board is there as the caretaker of all of the assets of the company, the company being that separate legal personality. So all its assets and liabilities are owned by the company and they constitute the shareholders investment into the company. So that is the board's responsibility to make sure that those assets are protected. And the board has a responsibility to consider how risk is approached and addressed in terms of achieving that strategy. Risk becomes an integral component as to how the board makes decisions. It would be ludicrous for a board to make a decision 
without considering what the risks might be involved in that decision. To use our example of Steve Jobs and the iPad, when he pitched that to the board, the board must have considered what the risks would be, how one manufactures or something like that, whether people buy it, it's an awfully expensive product to invest in. All of those risks to that strategy need to be considered. Then they need to put together a policy as to how they are going to manage risk on, a, on, on an ongoing basis in light of the strategy. And that policy is typically going to be your risk management plan. Through that, they need to evaluate those risks and agree this appetite and tolerance as to how much risk are we prepared to take on when we do the strategy. If we're going to have a strategy to fly airplanes, we must understand in that risk appetite universe that we are going to crash planes. Planes will crash. That it has happened enough times in history that we know that that is a risk. What is our tolerance level in terms of running an airline and, and, and particularly plane crashes? If we have one plane crash, does that, is our risk tolerance that we can tolerate as the absolute most risk and um, anything over and above that means that we have to exit this business? It depends on what our strategy is. Once we understand what risk we're prepared to take on and how we're going to manage it, we then delegate responsibility to management for implementing it and executing all of that, that risk strategy. Executive managers will then take business decisions within the framework of that risk appetite and risk tolerance, and they must also up identify any upside and downside risks at an operational level. On the whole, the board must be satisfied that in making their decisions, um, these managers have taken risk into account, as well as the expected returns, because obviously you're not going to get any returns if you don't take a suitable and managed level of risk. King 4 has set out um, a specific principle around risk, that the board should govern risk in a way that supports the company as it sets out and achieves its strategy. And in so doing, it must assess the risks and opportunities that arrive from the, the operating area, the ambit in which the board operates and the resources that it uses. It must assess its upside or opportunity risks that are presented. And I'll give you a really good example of this. So one of the risks to opening a bank account or operating in a banking environment is FICA legislation. Firstly, if you breach FICA legislation, the bank gets into an awful lot of trouble. And secondly, from a consumer point of view, having to fill out all those forms is just such a mission. No one wants to do it. So changing your bank is not something you're keen to do. You've got to go through that FICA process again. So this is where Time Bank saw an opportunity in a risk. By using technology to implement that FICA process in a far more streamlined and palatable way for its consumers, consumers were just so excited to go and use the little booths in the pick and pay and to go online and to open this account online without having to fill out all of these extensive forms that that was their upside in getting customers into their bank. I'm not sure what their strategy is in terms of once you're in there, I don't know what benefits there are, but they saw this opportunity of getting customers into their bank by using technology, and we all fell for it, and we all went and opened these lovely time bank accounts. There's been a lot of companies during COVID-19 who have used opportunity that is presented to them 
as a result of these risks. Uh, SAA, for example, has been placed in a position where it can renegotiate its leases with on its aeroplanes at a far lower rate because at the moment air travel is, is almost diminished and the suppliers of aeroplanes are really pressed. So SAA has this competitive advantage now to be able to renegotiate their leases. Uh, SAA also was the first to use the opportunity to, to do away with cancellation fees. So if anybody needed to cancel a flight over this period of time while we're all experiencing COVID-19, they weren't going to be prejudiced, which then created the opportunity that people were going to use SAA because they knew that if they had to cancel their flights, they would be fine. And if you think about it from a brand trust point of view, if Checkers, for example, said to you, we have slashed the price of hand sanitizer down by 90%. We are selling our hand sanitizer at a loss, but we want you as the consumer to be safe and have this product in your house. And they regulated it to three bottles per person. If Checkers did that, what kind of brand loyalty would they be generating? It would be phenomenal. People would always believe after that the checkers had their best interests at heart because they had utilized this opportunity that had come out of a risk. So I hope that illustrates to you upside and opportunity risk. Very important in King 4, they talk a lot about making sure that when you assess risks, you also assess those opportunities that can come out of a risk. Then when assessing your risk, you must make sure that your resources that you have available to you are sufficient to manage those risks. And how dependent are we on our resources? If we are very dependent on our natural environment in order to pr produce our work, so if you're a quarry, for example, and your product is soil that you sell, how are you operating in that environmental space that, con that your strategy to continue selling soil for the next hundred years is going to play out? Are you going to have access to that soil? Are you going to be able to continue to utilize that soil in the same way that you did before? When we think about how we respond to risk, we need to make sure that those responses are appropriate, that they are adequately financed, that they don't cost more than the risk itself would cost. And we need to make sure that our business continues to run on a sustainable basis. So we have business continuity um, during this COVID-19 um, incident. I think everyone is aware that we've had to do some self-isolation. How do banks continue to run? How do hospitals, fire extensions, how do these procedures and services, how does MTN and Vodacom still continue to run? Because they have business continuity plans in place so that if there's any disruption, any un unanticipated shock that the company receives, it can continue to do business and it's not going to go under. And then we need to make sure that healthy risk management practices are embedded and integrated into everything that we do, and it's part of our culture. We don't want to shut out risk completely because without risk we can't get reward, but we need to make sure that we can get as much reward as possible with as little risk as possible. Continuing with management's responsibility in terms of risk management, the board has this responsibility, which it is now delegated down to management to actually implement on a day-to-day -day basis. And management needs to make sure that they have this, they operate within this risk management framework, that they have policies and internal controls and all the necessary methods and tools to inculcate that risk management throughout the culture of the company. They need to make disclosures so that stakeholders ultimately through the board can have assurance 
that risk is effectively operated, that there are efficient operations in place, that the assets of the company are safeguarded, that the company is compliant with all its laws. I'm sure you've seen lots of adverts for compliance managers. Um, there's a great deal of risk in just accidentally not complying with certain laws. So compliance is in itself a risk. Um, supporting sustainable business when there are adverse conditions such as COVID-19, that the reporting that comes out, the report must actually say that the report that comes out is reliable, that all our financial reporting is based on solid internal financial controls and, and it can be trusted, and that we have responsibility towards all our stakeholders, and, um, and we are aware of that. While we're talking about risk and risk management, let's just very quickly have a look at what King Four says about technology and information, because this is an area which modern boards have to govern um, with specific reference to risk management. So all companies operate on some degree of technology and they all rely on some degree of information in order to set its strategy, in order to actually deliver its strategy, we have this high dependence on technology and information. So we need to make sure that they are governed properly. We need to make sure that all of our people, our technology, our information and our processes are all integrated. All the risks that are related to technology and information are integrated and that our business is resilient. So if our server goes down, our printer stops working or we have power outages, how does our business with limited access to technology or information continue to run sustainably? How do we make sure that information um, and we have the information to identify and respond to incidences such as leaks, hacking, that sort of thing? How do we know, how are we, how are we protecting ourselves against um, risks that relate to technology and information? A lot of us depend on outsourced service providers because technology is very technical by nature and if I am but a mere lawyer I have to rely on an IT person um, and particularly an outsourced IT person to manage those IT risks for me. So how do I manage my IT person and ensure that they are, are on the same page as me in terms of risk management and that they have my best interests in heart? We also put a lot of money into technology and information. If you are ever able to see the capital budget of your companies, you will notice that there will be a massive amount. And it's not the CEO's salary, it's actually the investment into laptops, computers, servers, infrastructure. It is probably the most, most expensive component of your company's investment. How do you protect that? When you have obsolete technology and information, how do you get rid of it? So from a technology point of view, do we go and dump all our photocopiers in the Sprite and hope that, um, I don't know, the little fishies eat the plastic? Uh, or how do, we, how do we get rid of all of this old redundant stuff that's full of chemicals and, and products that could be harmful to the environment? And particularly with Poppy becoming live now, information, how do we secure information? once we no longer need it. We have our HR records. Um, what if a staff member leaves? Do we just delete that information from the server? Um, how do we make sure that that information is still protected, time to come, personal information about our staff members? And so overall, we need to make sure that technology and information is used ethically and responsibly in, in compliance with law. King differentiates between information and technology. Information being something that is related to the company's intellectual capital, confidentiality, integrity, um, and availability of information. Personal information is involved in there too, and how that information is kept secure. Technology relates more to that physical infrastructure, 
around the de achievement of our strategic and operational objectives, our computers that we use, um, our products that we sell that rely on, on mechanized um, technological components, how we source that technology. If you think about succession planning in terms of a board of directors, how do we keep succession planning in terms of our suppliers? If a supplier is not able to produce to to provide us with goods what are we how do we continue to to run our operation and then developments in technology this just flies on an ongoing basis it's very hard to keep up with and yet we need to do so in order to keep our competitive edge in business and we need to make sure that that's a risk that we're continuously trying to manage Okay, let's have a look at the Social and Ethics Committee. This is the other committee that is mandated by the Companies Act for companies which are either public companies, uh, listed companies, and social and, uh, I beg your pardon, and um, state owned companies, and any company that has a a uh, public interest score of over 500. So these are companies that have a great deal of stakeholders. So as we go through their key duties and functions, I just want you to bear in mind, these are companies that are reaching a lot of people that are having a big impact on our environment, that are having a big impact on their suppliers and their customers and their employees. And therefore it is important that we have somebody overseeing that relationship and that um, it is managed appropriately. So when you go through the, the uh, duties and functions in the Companies Act, it does seem quite unwieldy. So on this slide, what I've tried to do is just summarize those five key areas of responsibility for this committee. Social and economic development, good corporate citizenship, the environment, health and public safety, consumer relationships, labor, and employment. So those are the five key areas that this committee needs to consider. Under social and economic development, there are international uh, bylaws, shall we say, compacts and principles to which the country South Africa subscribes. And as a result of that, the Companies Act has now brought those to us. So the 10 principles of the Global Compact from the UN, the OECD recommendations regarding um, corruption, the Employment Equity Act, which is local, and the Broad-Based Black Economic Empowerment Act, which is local. These all talk about um, being a fair member of society, um, how one treats staff members, how one does not employ underage children, maternity leave, um, all of those social structures that you would expect from a company that was a good, good corporate citizen. And then it looks specifically at good corporate citizenship. South Africa, as you know, has a constitution which is probably ahead of its time, but rightly so. And this brings through some of those constitutional components around Regardless of where the legislation sits, you should have an overall um, ability to promote equality, to prevent unfair discrimination, and reduce corruption wherever you can. Contribute to the development of communities that are impacted by your activities. There is no legislation that says you must do these things, but as a good corporate citizen, you should be doing these things. Then you need to have a record of all of your sponsorships, donations, charitable givings that you, that you make into your community. Environment health safety is pretty well legislated in South Africa through Occupational Health and Safety Acts and the Mining Occupational Health and Safety Act and the National Environmental Management Act, which actually has criminal sanctions attached to it. So our legislation in, in that regard is, is quite strong. However, safety and health and, and issues that involve the environment happen so frequently in our day-to-day -day operations that sometimes we may not be thinking about uh, a particular section of an act, but we need to think of it broadly speaking. And the COVID-19 is a good example of that, of saying, 
in the interests of public safety, let's try and implement work from home initiatives where we can, so we can flatten the curve, so to speak. We must also treat our customer base with a degree of respect and, and maybe more so than just legislation requires. Particular regard that must be had to the Consumer Protection Act, the National Credit Act around responsible lending. And then our employees. The Act refers to the International Labour Organization's Protocol on Decent Work and Working Conditions. This sets a very low bar, this, this particular protocol, um, and the uh, Basic Conditions of Employment Act are actually much better and much provide a better environment for staff members. But uh, basically, this one of the provisions here is that we cannot have slaves. Um, we must also have ensure that our relationships with our employees um, not only abide by law but also have um, a greater social impact, particularly things around supporting ongoing education for our, our employees. Okay, how is this committee made up? The Companies Act again mandates to us who goes into this committee. We must have a minimum of three members. This committee, we may also have our executive directors and our non-executive directors, a uh, majority of non-executive directors, so says the Companies Act, but we have the ability to have, a, have our CFO or our CEO sitting on this. It may also include prescribed officers, so those are people with the substantial control over portions of the business. So if your company secretary is a prescribed officer, then they may serve on this committee. There are disclosures that they need to make, the overall role that they performed, how they composed, the advisors that they might have used during the year, key focus areas, the number of meetings that they had, and whether they satisfied that they have um, fulfilled their responsibilities. And they need to report to shareholders at the AGM on how they discharge these functions. Okay, let's have a look at the remuneration committee. The key functions of a remuneration committee, which is definitely mandated by the JSE, but not required by the Companies Act, is this implementation of the remuneration policy. So, when you are developing your strategy, you need somebody to implement your strategy. And this is going to be your executive directors and their management team. So these are the people that you really want to incentivize and remunerate in a way that aligns with your strategy. If you have a strategy to become a billion rand company, is it not worth paying someone 10 million rand to do that? 10 million rand sounds like an awfully big amount of money to pay someone as a salary. But if you are going to earn 999 million rand out of that, surely that was a worthwhile investment. So in order to deliver that strategy, you need to pay for the right people to come in and do it. So you develop your policy. And that's the core responsibility of the remuneration committee. They must then make sure that that policy is consistently applied throughout the whole company. And they must report to shareholders on the activities um, around the, 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 this particular policy and how it's implemented. And that then gives the shareholders the ability to weigh in on this remuneration component, which is primarily in conflict with shareholders. So if you think that shareholders are looking for that surplus cash in the company, they want dividends. Any surplus cash in the company, the, from the director's perspective, they're going to be wanting bonuses. So there is a natural conflict that happens there. And the remuneration committee can give shareholders an insight into this by giving the shareholders the opportunity to have a non-binding vote on the remuneration policy at the AGM. So we have our AGM um, and our shareholders come along and they vote and they are given the opportunity to vote on the remuneration policy. 
um, and how it's implemented. And it's a non-binding vote, which means that if it doesn't pass, that's fine, the company can still implement that remuneration uh, policy um, and its implementation plan, but they must engage with shareholders on what components they did not like about that remuneration policy. So it makes, it makes a degree of direct accountability to the shareholders around remuneration. This committee is constituted of only non-executive directors. You can immediately see that there would be a massive conflict if you had executive directors sitting on this committee. The majority of these directors, these non-executive directors should be independent. And King says that the chairman of the board should not be the chairman of this committee. He can be a member, but not the chair, and the chairman should definitely be independent. The executives may attend the meeting, but they obviously cannot participate in any discussion around their own remuneration. So if we're discussing the CEO's remuneration, he has to recuse himself from the room, and the CFO may stay, by way of example, and vice versa. When we talk about the CFO's remuneration, he will have to excuse himself. And um, so the committee will continue with its business. Quite often, the committee has to rely on external advisors. One of the core elements of determining whether or not the remuneration is fair in terms of the strategy is to use benchmarking. And there are a lot of reports that go into benchmarking and a lot of research that was done by specialist consultants. We have to consider Typically, a CFO in this environment, what do they earn? What is a competitive package? How do we structure it across the, the strategy so we get long-term value from the strategy, not just short-term value? And we often depend on financial consultants to assist us with that. They also have typical disclosures that they need to make. So the overall role and responsibility that they performed, um, their composition, the external advisors that they depended upon, the key areas of focus, how many meetings they were held and did their members attend, and whether they are satisfied that they have fulfilled their responsibilities in terms of their terms of reference. Now, obviously, if they are going to put a vote to the shareholders at the AGM with regards to um, that remuneration policy, they are going to need to report to shareholders on that policy. And this is how the reporting is done. It's done in what we would call a remuneration report to shareholders, and it explains the remuneration policy and the implementation plan during the period. It's typically made up of three sections. One is a background statement, which is made by the chairman of the remuneration committee, where he sets the environment, the uh, economic environment out for the reader, what conditions the company is operating under, um, what voting had happened in the past in terms of this particular remuneration report, what their plans have been, how the company has performed. And then it goes into the second part, which gives the main provisions of the remuneration policy. Now, a remuneration policy may be very long. It can be up to sort of 20 pages. You can't give that whole document to shareholders. You can make it available on your website. Certainly, you should do that, but you can't put that into your integrated report. So in your remuneration report, you would just put an overview of those main provisions, particularly focusing on your remuneration philosophy. How is it that you, you think you need to pay your, your staff in order to deliver the strategy? And then the third component is an implementation report or an implementation plan, which then shows how you implement that remuneration policy and what was the impact of implementing it. So when you measure the performance of your CEO over the years, did he meet his key performance indicators and how much of his salary or bonus structures did he get as a result of having met or not met those key performance areas? So that 
holistically is what you would put into your remuneration report to shareholders and they would then make those two votes. It's uh, probably a lot more interesting to go and have a look at one of these, these reports in, 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 in an integrated report and go and have a, see if you can find where these components are and read them for yourselves. It makes it for a far more alive exercise in learning. Let's have a look at our nomination committee. We discussed um, the importance of succession planning, the importance of induction programs, the importance of ensuring that there is com continuous evaluation and for a formal performance evaluation process for boards and committees and chairman and CEO to go through. Okay, so the key functions of this committee would be for developing a process for nominating, electing and appointing new members of the board, for ensuring that there are proper succession plans, for inducting new directors, for ensuring that once our directors are on our board, that they continue to um, adhere to, to their knowledge regime, that they have Con they attend continued professional development. If you've hired a bunch of accountants, CAs, you definitely want to make sure that they, they stay up to date with, with accounting regulations. And then develop a process for evaluating the performance of the board, the individuals, and at least the chairman. This committee is constituted only of um, non-executive directors majority of them being independent, and they say the chairman should be independent and can be the chairman of the board. Their disclosures, again, they would have to disclose the role, um, their responsibilities and functions, how they were composed, any external advisors that they relied on, their focus areas during the reporting period, the number of meetings they held, whether they satisfied that they fulfilled their own responsibilities. And then if it's a listed company, they must make a disclosure. Now, it is a little bit strange, true, that a nomination committee is not required by the JSE, but irrespective, a disclosure must be made by the listed company on these aspects. And if you don't have a nomination committee, you're going to have to make sure that one of your committees considers these matters so that you can still make this report to the JSE. And this is what you need to report on. Your policy on gender and racial diversity at your board. This policy is intended for the board to specifically consider its own diversity elements with relation to gender and, and race. In the new listings requirements, which came out on the 2nd of December 2019, the name of this report has changed to the diversity policy, and it's to look more broadly at age, uh, disability, different types of skills. So they've broadened that application of diversity. And if you have set any targets, so for in it, you might say, in it, for example, in five years we will be 50% men, 50% women, or we will be 60% black, 60% or 40% white. You may set those targets. You don't have to. If you have set those targets, however, then you do need to report back on how you're progressing against those targets. And that brings us to the end of nomination committees and it brings us to the end of our discussion on board committees and their functions.